So our, uh, our scripture text this morning is Luke chapter 23, uh, verses 13 to 25. You're welcome to look at the screen behind me as I read this, or you can follow along on your own device, or if you want to use uh, one of the Bibles that are in the, uh, the chair racks, then Luke 12, uh, 23, 13 is on page 1123 of those Bibles. Now, we're jumping back into the trial of Jesus this morning. Uh, if you are here last week, uh, we talked about the first part of the trial, uh, the examination of Jesus by the Jewish uh, high ruling, and their voices prevailed. So Pilate decided that their demand should be granted. He released the man who had been thrown into prison for insurrection and murder for whom they asked, but he delivered Jesus over to their will. This is the word of the Lord. Please be seated. Is it possible to get just a little bit more volume, Jim? Thank you. So at the, end of, at the end of Charles Dickens' classic novel, A Tale of Two Cities, there is a remarkable twist in the, in the plot. Now, incidentally, um, if you're in high school, right, have been to high school. Are you in high school? Some of you are in high school. Have you been to high school? Some of you have been to high school. Some of you may aspire to go to high school someday. All right, a Tale of Two Cities is one of the books that I read in high school uh, that's supposed to be boring literature, right? But it's actually an action-adventure political thriller. It really is. And in this scene toward the end of the story, at the height of the French Revolution in the late 1700s, a son of the aristocracy, a guy by the name of Charles Darnay, is arrested for crimes against the Republic, treason. But just before his scheduled execution, his friend and his attorney, I think, actually, Sidney Carton, who looks remarkably like him, drugs him, switches clothes with him, and takes his place on death row. Right? But as he's waiting to die, he meets a poor seamstress, a young woman caught up in all the chaos of the French Revolution, who is also scheduled for execution. Now, the woman had met Charles Darnay, and, and she's thinking that she's talking to the real Charles Darnay, telling like him all about her situation, asking if, if she might be able to ride with him on the way to the, the, the guillotine. But as she's talking and she looks a little bit more closely at him, she's looking at him, and then her face changes. First, kind of confusion, and then astonishment as she realizes that the guy who was about to die is not the real Charles Darnay. And she gazes up in amazement and she whispers, are you dying for him? The amazement of the discovery that an innocent man will die in the place of the condemned. And what we just read, we see this on an even grander scale. And three themes come clearly into view. First theme, the unmistakable innocence of Jesus. The unavoidable responsibility of those who are involved in his trial. And the unbelievable pardon we receive as a result of what happens. Right? Three themes. They're listed for you in your bulletin if you want to follow along there. Right? Unmistakable innocence, unavoidable responsibility, and unbelievable pardon. Now first, unmistakable innocence. Jesus' trial is recorded in all four of the gospel accounts, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and they all have their different emphases. And Luke does provide at certain points a little bit less detail about the conversations and things say, in comparison to, like you know, say, John. But there is one thing that Luke absolutely is trying to emphasize throughout, and that is the innocence of Jesus. It's no accident in human history that Jesus found himself on trial before a Roman court. Right? Unparalleled in its time and in history up to that point, the Roman system of justice, though brutal at times, admittedly, was not barbarian mob rule. There was process. There were rules that were clearly defined. There were proceedings that were to be followed. And when Pilate says in verse 14 that his ruling is based upon his examining Jesus, that word examining is talking about a formal legal examination. That's what the term refers to, a formal legal examination. That's what was going on. And John, in his account, John's gospel, gives us a little bit more detail about the questioning. But Luke just jumps right to the verdict. And that is not guilty. That's what Pilate says in verse 14. Now that Jesus is back from meeting with, with King Herod, Pilate says, look, we've already been over this. Back when I examined him before, I did not find this man guilty of any of the charges you brought against him. 
We've done this. And if you look back at last week in verse 4, that's what Pilate says. After the formal trial, he announces to the chief priests, right? Think of them as sort of the prosecutors, the chief priests. They're the prosecutors. And he announces to the crowd, this is like the gallery at the trial, and he says, verse 4, I find no guilt in this man. Now, back when he said it the first time, the Jewish leaders, they didn't like the verdict, right? So they went along with, with Pilate's idea to have Herod try him instead. It's all right, we, this is, you want to send him to Herod? Fine, we'll go to Herod. And it seems as if Herod, in his examination of Jesus, came to the very same conclusion. Now, I don't think that Herod probably felt the same sense of, you know, uh, of duty to the Roman system of justice, certainly. But it seems like he agreed with the, with the Roman evaluation of the facts anyway, because at least that's what Pilate says in verse 15. He says, I didn't find Jesus guilty of anything deserving death. And neither did Herod. So, so here we are again. That's what Pilate's saying. Now, Pilate then offers his ruling again in verse 16. He says, I will therefore punish him and release him. Now, this would have been, this punishment that he's talking about here, this would have been a lighter beating compared to what one would have experienced and what Jesus would experience prior to crucifixion. All right? Still not pleasant, but more like a warning to kind of stop stirring up trouble. Trouble. Right? Just like an admonishment. Now, it may not seem entirely fair to us, but this was common practice in the Roman system of justice to kind of do this. It's like, okay, at the very least, he's not guilty of the crimes that are being brought against him, but at the very least, he's causing problems and stuff. And so we'll just give him a, you know, a light beating sort of as a, as a warning. And we can think of it kind of like a negotiation between the judge and the prosecutors. You know, look, your capital charges, they're never going to stick. How about we just move it to like a misdemeanor and we move on from there? Right? The prosecutors, though, they don't like the deal. And so Pilate says again in verse 22, What evil has he done? I have found no guilt in this man, nothing deserving death. Now, Pilate, he ended up caving. He totally sold, as the cool people say. Right? That's what he did. We'll see that in a minute. But the most important thing for now is to notice that Jesus went to his death, rejected and condemned, and not because of any facts that proved his own guilt. And others seem to notice this as well, right? We'll, we'll, read, we'll read this next week, later in chapter 23. But the thief, dying next to Jesus on the cross, said, we are receiving the due reward of our deeds, but this man has done nothing wrong. And even further in Luke 23, Luke tells us that the Roman centurion who was on duty at Jesus' crucifixion, after he had watched everything that had taken place, said, certainly this man was innocent. Now, that's point number one, right? The unmistakable innocence. But one observation before we move on from this. Most people do not reject Jesus based on the facts. Now, some, I know, some people I know try to do. They try to do a careful analysis of the facts about Jesus. But the vast majority of people don't do a careful analysis of, of the facts about Jesus' life, the historical record, the, the evidence for the resurrection. Very few, few people would look at the trial of Jesus and say, you know, after all, I think he probably was guilty. Right? No, what they probably say with Pilate is that Jesus was, was innocent, and yet they still reject Jesus based not on the evidence, but almost in, in, in almost all instances, based on their own personal agenda. In other words, they don't believe the facts about Jesus' identity, not because they've examined the evidence, but because they don't like what the evidence might mean. And so, like Pilate, they just ignore it. Uh, Tim Keller, who spent decades in Manhattan answering objections about Jesus to, to, to young people, said that whenever he would encounter a young person from a Christian home who came home to his parents as a young adult, and this young man or woman says that they no longer believe in Jesus. Right? He says it was almost never about the evidence. Keller says the first question he would often ask a young person like this is, how long have you been sleeping with your girlfriend or with your boyfriend? Right? And, this, and this, his point was not that, 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 is, is not that people very often reject Jesus on the, on the basis of real things. It is real, but it's not on a real examination of the facts. It's not on the basis of the evidence uh, for his perfect life or his sacrificial death, right? They might use those things as kind of objections, but that's not really what the objection is. The objection is real, really more on their, based on their personal agenda, not on the facts of the case. And that's what was happening here, right? That's the first theme. Jesus was clearly judged to be innocent, and it seems as if almost everybody knew it, right? Even the Jewish leaders, they trumped up the charge, they kind of conspired with the crowd. They knew that they were orchestrating things. Now, they thought they had good reason for it. The reason was to protect themselves and their own level of influence. 
But everyone knew that he was, was innocent. And yet this clear fact was not enough to keep Jesus from being sentenced to die. That's point number one. Now, theme number two, right? Who's responsible for this miscarriage of justice? Well, it's clear that the it's clear the Jewish leaders are, are the ones who are driving this conspiracy. That's certainly happening. They're the ones who won't accept Pilate's verdict. They keep pressing. They're the ones who stirred up the crowds. That's what it says in Mark 15. They were stirring up the crowds. And all the, Jewish, all the Jewish leaders, not just some of them, they're all implicated at one point or another. You've got the chief priests. You've got the scribes. You've got the, the whole assembly, the, the Sanhedrin, the, the, the council of the, of the Jewish leaders. Right? The religious liberals, the Sadducees, they were against Jesus. The religious conservatives, the, the Pharisees, right? they had always disliked Jesus. So clearly, the Jewish leaders, they, are, they, they bear responsibility. But it isn't just the Jewish leaders. Right? Lots of common people here, too, the crowds. And the crowds do bear some responsibility. I mean, absolutely. It's unlikely that the leaders alone could have convinced Pilate to change his mind about his verdict if there wasn't the threat of a disturbance in the background which is why the leaders riled, the, riled them up. And, and, and just because the leaders incited them and encouraged them, it doesn't mean that they're innocent in the process. Right? The, the, the mob can be whipped up by a, a charismatic leader, but ultimately, what is it about the hearts of people that can be so easily led astray by the charisma of a leader or, or so easily flow along with the peer pressure of the crowd? Right? Why did the German people close their eyes to the Holocaust even when they could see the smoke from the death camps? Right, why did so many Rwandans participate in the ethnic genocides of 1994? Why did so many professing Christians, often with really good theology in lots of other areas, pretend that the ownership and brutal treatment of Africans was somehow just some peculiar institution? Right? What keeps supposedly good men and women silent in the face of evil, or worse yet, what carries them along to actively participate in that evil? It's our own sin. And the crowds bear some of that responsibility as well, right? So they're responsible. Now, just so we're clear that the responsibility is not just with the Jewish people, remember God's historical sovereignty here, right? Jesus came when the Jewish people didn't hold ultimate political authority. The Romans did. And while Pilate may have wanted to stay out of it, the decision to execute Jesus was ultimately his decision. And whether he was convinced of Jesus' innocence or not, the Roman soldiers were the ones who acted on his commands to put Jesus to death. And what Pilate was so concerned about was the opinions of, the, of, of what the local people might think of him or what Caesar might think of him if the Jewish leaders had complained to Caesar about, about how he was ruling. He was so concerned with the political expediency of it all that he just cast truth and justice to the side and he played along. This in, supposedly, the greatest system of justice of the time. No, he bears responsibility too. And so the Jews, the Romans, the leaders, the people, everyone here is implicated. And that's the point. We can't point fingers at the other person. We're all involved. None of us can run from the responsibility of Jesus' death. And this creates what, what Phil Reichen calls the, the desperate dilemma on our part. Uh, we've been watching a lot of college basketball in our house the last couple of weeks, you know, March Madness and all. And, and sometimes you're watching these games, and if you don't have a rooting interest, you're not really even sure who you're rooting for. You kind of go back and forth depending on how the game's gone. Ah, I thought I was rooting for that team. Now I'm rooting for, for this team. Well, most Christians, and particularly, um, and particularly when you read this story, you kind of you kind of find yourself having sympathy towards Jesus. You're kind of rooting for him. He's the good guy in the story. And, and so you're reading this, and you're kind of rooting for him to get off. Right? It's understandable. After all, we've just established he's innocent of the charges. It's kind of a miscarriage of justice. And there's a part of you, as you're watching the drama unfold, that would just like, you know, you would really, like, you'd love the story if it kind of turned out. Like, you know, all of a sudden, what would happen if Pilate kind of manned up and said to the soldiers, no, 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 get around Jesus, protect him from the mobs. Right? You're kind of like, yeah. Like, I mean, that would be, that would be a dramatic kind of, kind of moment. Right? But Phil Reichen tells a story about the time he attended one of those um, Easter drama plays have you ever been to one of those? It's like a you know, big dramatic production of the life of Jesus, and it ends with, with his death and with his resurrection. And he says that during the, the trial scene of the play, the scene that we're reading about, members of the cast quietly kind of slipped into the audience, and they kind of sat among the audience. It was dark. People didn't notice it. But right at the moment when Pontius Pilate appeals for Jesus' release, these actors and actresses start standing up all over the theater in the midst of the audience. And they start shouting, no, crucify him, 
And Riken said, he said, I almost forgot it was a place. And my first instinct was to just grab one of these guys and say, sit down, be quiet. And then he said he realized two things. First, he realized that the shouting coming from the audience and not from on stage, he said, was absolutely appropriate because he too, in the audience, was responsible for the crucifixion of Jesus, his sin. And then second, he realized, as he thought about it a little bit more, that if there was any hope for him, for his sins to be forgiven, then what was about to happen was exactly what needed to happen. It was a real dilemma. Who are you rooting for? If you have a sense of justice, you're rooting for Jesus to get off, to not go to the cross. But if you have a sense of your own guilt and your own responsibility in the matter, you're kind of backed into the position of rooting for Jesus to resist the temptation to just call down the legions of angels and toast the Romans at that moment. Right? Reichen said this is where he ended up, and not because he, he desired the injustice of it all, but because he saw his own need for Jesus to go to the cross, and he said at that moment, he said to himself, yeah, if it has to be, crucify him, because I need a Savior. See, when you accept your own responsibility in the condemnation of Jesus, then that's where it will lead, where it has to lead, if you have any hope of salvation. And hope is ultimately what we see in the, the third theme here, right? We see, we see Jesus' unmistakable innocence. We see our unavoidable responsibility. And finally, we see this unbelievable pardon. You may have noticed that there is no verse 17 listed in what we read, right? If you were looking at a Bible, you kind of see it. It's like 16, 18. And you're like, wait a minute, typo, right? Sometimes kids, you get extra credit on your papers if you find a typo that the teacher had in there, right? Did I, did I find a typo? Do I get extra credit? No, actually, the, the reason why it's not there is because the most reliable Greek manuscripts don't have that verse, don't have verse 17. It appears as if it was added later. Now, before you get concerned about that, verse 17 didn't say anything that the other gospel accounts don't already tell us and what Luke already assumes. It says that Pilate was obliged to release one man at the festival. All right, in other words, there had been this, there was this custom to release one prisoner at the time of the Passover, a Passover pardon, if you will. Now, we don't know a lot more about the custom than what we read here in the Bible, but it does fit with historical precedent elsewhere that something like this might, might have happened, and it certainly fits with the Passover theme. Right? In fact, there's great amount of significance for Pontius Pilate kind of saying, like, all right, this will kind of fit with the you know, Jewish culture and the religion of the time. Let's do, this at, let's do this at Passover, because what is Passover, you remember? It's when the people of Israel were in Egypt centuries before this happened, and they were saved from God's judgment because they killed a perfect lamb and they put that lamb's blood on the doorposts of their homes. And so when the angel of death came to bring judgment on the, on the land, the, 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 the angel would see that the sacrifice had been made in the place of the people in that residence, and the angel would pass over that home because of the blood of the innocent lamb. Now, one way or another, Luke assumes his readers would have known about it because he just skips, the, the re, skips to the request that the people make. Release to us Barabbas, but that's the background. That's why they're able to say that. Now, who's Barabbas? Who's this guy Barabbas? Well, Luke tells us that he was in prison on death row himself, presumably, for insurrection and murder. In other words, he was a rebel who had started an uprising and killed someone, probably a Roman, in the process of this uprising. And just like there was no real dispute about Jesus' innocence, there doesn't seem to be any dispute here about Barabbas' guilt. And yet the crowds want Pilate to release to us Barabbas. And here's where the significance of this happening, happening at Passover becomes profound, right? The guilty one, Barabbas, will be spared the righteous judgment of God because the blood of Jesus, the one who John called the Lamb of God, because, of the, because the blood of Jesus will be spilled. Because Jesus' death will be in the place of Barabbas'. Now, some of you might say, well, that seems kind of harsh. You might say, I mean, okay, it's cool, right? Barabbas is guilty, he's shown mercy, but did Jesus really have to die too? Is that really how it had to work? I mean, couldn't Barabbas get a second chance and Jesus be freed also? But see, that's not how justice works. It's not how justice works. Uh, many of you know that I love... Um, uh, Victor Hugo's uh, famous story, Les Miserables. I don't know, maybe it's the uprisings in it, it, the, 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 the riots in Paris this past week. The Tale of Two Cities, Les Miserables. Like, I'm in sort of French insurrection mode this morning, right? But in Les Miserables, 
Right? And if you've been along, around, around long enough, you know, right? I can't, come, I can't help but come, keep coming back to this story. Now, usually I'm picking on the character Javert, right? Because he's the, he's the antagonist. He's sort of the bad guy in the story. He's the buttoned up, stern police officer who just can't leave the main character Jean Valjean alone, who chases him without mercy. And it's true, right? That is a Javert is this picture of cold justice. And we all wish when we, when we watch the musical or we watch one of the mu- movie adaptations or if someone somewhere reads the really long book, we all wish that Javert would just give up and just leave Valjean alone. Just leave him alone. But you know, just think about this for a second. Let's point out what Javert got right in this pursuit of Valjean. Because Valjean, though he had reformed himself, right? He was, after all, still the guilty one. He was the convict, after all. He was the one who had broken his parole. Not just broken the law originally, but had broken his parole, changed his identity, who was on the run. He was the fugitive, and he was guilty of those crimes. Now, at the very end of the story, when Javert finally has Valjean arrested again, after all those years, this is the point. He actually does have justice on his side. And so when you finally reach this very powerful scene when he releases Valjean, and my favorite version of it is still the Liam Neeson, Jeffrey Rush movie version from 1998, right? And in, the, in this very climactic scene, in the, and it particularly comes out in, the, in this movie, right? Javert gets one very important thing right. He understands almost nothing about divine grace. But he does know this, and he knows this absolutely correctly. Grace to be grace cannot be free. Someone has to pay the price. Which is why in the scene that the 1998 movie version, you know, the way they do it, why it's so powerful, right? Javert takes Valjean to the edge of the, the River Seine in Paris. And Valjean, and, and Valjean is, is, is shackled, he's handcuffed. And he probably thinks that Javert's going to push him into the river and kill him. He'll drown because his hands are shackled, right? But he doesn't. What Javert does, and it's, it, it, it's a shocking moment. It's, it's almost unbelievable. Javert takes the shackles off of Valjean And he doesn't just throw him to the ground and tell Valjean to go. He puts the shackles on himself. And then he falls backward into the river to his own death. And after Javert does that, it all happens so fast, Valjean looks down at his arms and he's he's shocked. And this look of puzzlement turns to this absolute look of relief, of complete joy, because now he finally realizes he's free. Can you imagine... For a second, the conversation the guards must have had with Barabbas. Right? Think about this. When they go to get him in the holding cell. Now, I'm just imagining here, but think about it, right? right? Hey, Barabbas, come here. Come here for a second. Yeah. Uh, you're free. You can go. Now, imagine his response. Wait, what? All right, what happened? This is a trick, right? Right? You're just going to stab me as I run out the door. Right? No. You're good. You're free. And maybe Barabbas knew about the Passover pardon tradition, right? Maybe he said, oh, wait, wait, I get it. I know what happened. Pilate showed mercy on me because of the Passover. Is that what happened? Pilate had favor for me. And the guards would have probably laughed and said, no, actually, actually they wanted to re- he wanted to release someone else. <laughs> and it wasn't you. So what happened then? Barabbas might have asked. And the guards would have said, well, th- th- that, that's that guy, the one he wanted to release, that guy's going to die instead and, and you're going to be free. And see, and that's where the decision point comes. Right? Here's where it becomes very personal for all of us. If you were Barabbas and you know you're guilty and you hear this good news that someone else has gone to die in your place, right? two things could have happened. Barabbas could have said, cool, whatever, stinks for him, but hey, I'm back. Or, Or, on the other hand, when Barabbas learned that another man was dying in his place, he could have been struck with amazement and asked the guards, who is he? Who is this man who is dying instead of me? And the guard might have responded, I don't know. His name's Jesus. I think that means savior or something in your language. And indeed it does. And indeed he is a savior. And that's how he accomplishes it. And what's remarkable is that in this case, Jesus is not dying for his friend. In, in, in A Tale of Two Cities, Sidney Carton takes the place of Charles Darnay, and that's noble, but they're friends, remember. 
Carton feels like he's repaying a debt of sorts to, to Darnell. Like, you know, he's helping out a good guy. And that's noble, but the sacrifice of Jesus is way better than that. The Apostle Paul tells us in Romans 5 that perhaps for a good person one would dare even to die, but God showed his love for us in this, in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. We were his enemies, Romans 5 tells us. Isaac Watts wrote, Alas, and did my Savior bleed, and did my sovereign die? Would he devote that sacred head for such a worm as I? Right? Who is it that changed places with you so that you can go free, so that you can experience the Passover pardon? His name is Jesus. It means Savior. And that's what kind of Savior he is. What a name. Right? From the song that we're going to sing in a, in a minute. In my place condemned he stood, sealed my pardon with his blood. Hallelujah. What a Savior. Do you hear the amazement? Do you hear the wonder? Have you experienced that? Have you experienced that amazement and wonder? If you haven't experienced that, then I would, I would, I would venture to say that perhaps you haven't experienced the Passover pardon. Right? You may have heard about the sacrifice of Jesus. It may have sounded noble, and you may have thought it's a really cool story. But if you haven't really been amazed by it, because, because you haven't really realized that your sin is what caused this man's death, if you haven't come to terms with the fact that it's your voice in the crowd demanding his execution, I haven't realized that you actually need him to die in your place if you want to go eternally free. But today you've heard it. I don't know if Barabbas heard any of the details about Jesus. I just made that conversation up, right? But you've heard it. How will you respond, right? Will you just go about your business? Right, will you just be inspired for a moment? Or will you fall down on your knees in faith and put your life into the hands of this Jesus and cry out, hallelujah, what a savior. Now, maybe you've done that already. Maybe recognizing this about Jesus is something you did years ago. What's in this for you? Well, here's the thing. If you have put your life into the hands of this Jesus, this Jesus who died, this Savior, then remember that what that means is what we just sang a couple minutes ago. This Jesus will never leave you. He will never forsake you. I already told you that the analogy isn't perfect, but back to that poor seamstress in A Tale of Two Cities on death row who, she, who, who meets who she thinks is Charles Darnay and finds out that it's really not. Right? She asks if she might ride with him in the cart on the way to the, the execution. She says, I'm little, I'm weak. It'll give me courage. And then when she realizes that this man she's talking to is not really Charles Darnay, but it's Charles Darnay's savior, and when she whispers in astonishment, are you dying for him? Right? Then, that's when she says to him, now with a whole different look, oh, you will let me hold your brave hand, won't you? And she hears the gentle response of the noble savior who says to her, Hush, my poor sister, to the last. If you have bowed before this Jesus, then when this world gets scary, this is the brave hand that grasps a hold of ours and will not let go. This is the Savior who stood in our place and took the condemnation we deserved. This is the one who quiets our fears and promises to hold us to the last. Let's pray. Father, we can never thank you enough for what you have done for us through Jesus, through the sacrifice that he has made. Lord, I pray that you would change our hearts, that you would give us that astonishment and wonder at what you have done, that we would consider our sin and not be crushed by it, but be amazed by a God who would pay the penalty for us and put our faith in that God. Lord, we pray these things and we pray them in the name of Jesus. Amen.